Okay, I think we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm pleased to see uh, people here in person and welcome to people who are joining us via Zoom webinar. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. First, some housekeeping things. We would welcome uh, people both in our in-person audience and joining us via Zoom to ask questions. Um, if you're on Zoom and would like to ask questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the Zoom window, not the chat. Um, if you're a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your questions. We like to prioritize trainee questions. Um, and also, uh, we have the ability to promote you to a panelist and ask the question yourself. So please, at the end of your question, write, can ask question myself or prefer to have question read. I'm Jeff Miller. I'm one of the co-directors of Grand Rounds. I'm joined today uh, on the Zoom webinar via Kate, by Kate Elkington um, and Christine Denny is our third Grand Rounds co-director. Um, next week's Grand Rounds will be in person again right here in the auditorium. It'll be the Brickell Memorial Award Grand Rounds. Our speaker, speaker will be Sherry Mollick, PhD and MDiv associate professor of psychology at George Washington. The title of her talk is Building Bridges Over Troubled Waters, Haven Connect Suicide Prevention Program for Black Youth in Faith com uh, Communities, which promises to be a very interesting grand rounds. Um, for those of you who are joining us in person, uh, please uh, come to lunch afterward in the multipurpose room at the end of the talk. I'm now going to hand things over to Betsy Fiddleson, who will um, give some context for today's talk and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, it's really a pleasure to um, be able to introduce today's speaker. I'm going to say a few words first and before I introduce um, Uju. Um, I'm wearing purple, as is uh, Dr. Barry, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we are so um, pleased and honored that we can host a domestic violence themed grand rounds each year for the last, I think, 10 years, right, Catherine? Um, through the um, generosity of the Chapman Perlman Foundation. So I want to give a, this is actually the 10 year anniversary of the start of our program. Um, so no one better to, to come talk about it than the person who's really doing a fantastic job leading it right now. But I wanted to give a little bit of context to where the program started and where we are now. So in 2010, the Bronx Family Justice Center opened and the Family Justice Centers, for those of you who don't know what they are, are sort of one-stop sh uh, shop of services for, for victims of DV. Um, including access to civil legal, the DEA's office, as well as a range of social, social services and counseling for survivors and families um, with an effort to really provide uh, greater support and accessibilities to services and resources to survivors and families. So um, our benefactor, Anna Chapman, who couldn't be her, here in person today, but I know is watching, so I can embarrass her um, <laughs> ex vivo here. Um, so Anna Chapman was invited to the ribbon cutting um, and when some of the case managers and counselors who were there spoke to her and, and learned that she was a psychiatrist, they said, oh, you know, it's so difficult to get some of our clients who really struggle into any sort of psychiatric care. And you can imagine many of the barriers, time, insurance, language, culture, stigma, mistrust of our systems and medical systems, among many other barriers. And Anna did something remarkable. She didn't just say, yes, it's so terrible and shrug her shoulders. She said, huh, I think we can do something about that. So she approached um, our chair at the time, Dr. Lieberman, um, who connected her with me and our remarkable colleague, uh, Catherine Monk. And we sat down together um, with um, Anna, her partner, Adavale Coslet, who's been um, working with the Chapman Perlman Foundation through this whole time as well as the then commissioner of what is now the New York City Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, uh, Yolanda Jimenez, um, to start talking about what, what we could put together. So out of that meeting eventually grew a pilot program and where we asked the questions, what happens if we take a psychiatrist and a psychologist out of the familiar comfort of the medical setting and co-locate them with an advocacy-based advocacy programs in the Bronx? Now, the answer to that question could have been a disaster, truly, <laughs> it really could have been. Fortunately, Catherine and I were blessed by fortune to encounter a, a truly remarkable group of people. So in addition to um, Anna and um, Adavale, who are um, so central to this effort and continue to be, 
Um, you know, former Mayor de Blasio and Shirlane McRae became very invested in this program. Um, the then executive director of the Bronx Family Justice Center, Margarita Guzman, was so central to this. Um, both the former commissioner and current commissioner, Cecile Noel, I can't say enough about how their support and um, uh, leadership has been uh, so important to this. Um, Ed Hill in the mayor's office, um, and then um, our partnership with New York City Health, um, Health and Hospitals through John Cancel, who is one of those people when you meet him, he's one of the people who can quietly make incredibly complex systems. And I think our system is complex, but I really had no idea until we were trying to sort of navigate two different city agencies and hospital systems. Um, he really is an angel of this program, um, Dr. Charles Barron. Um, and then our team, our clinical team, our first clinical team, Mayumi Akuda Benavides, a former resident here who I snatched right out of residency and we plugged her right in there. And she is amazing, as many of you know. Rosa Rodinkos, who um, I'm so thrilled is still offering um, education and her expertise in trauma. And Marina Weiss, um, who was uh, working in Catherine's lab and really has actually now, I forget where she is in her training, forgive me, Marina. She's at Adelphi now. And yes, I know she finished. I can no longer, I'm old enough, I can no longer remember when people are students and, and trainees, et cetera. Um, and really it's the people who really made this work. And as you'll hear, this program didn't just do okay, it really became a model that the, the city really invested in and expanded. And we're so fortunate that Uju took over in 2020, um, you know, in the, in the most difficult period of the pandemic and, and really not only took over and helped the program survive, but thrive, really thrive. Um, and um, as I reflect back on this remarkable 10 years, I want to think about the, I, I really do think about um, the transformative potential of this model of partnership between public institutions, private philanthropy, and academic, academic institutions. And I've been at Columbia my whole career when I have my moments, as we all do. Um, I think about the truly amazing things that can happen when our institutions center the needs of the people we are supposed to serve, our patients and survivors. And I want to remind everyone here that we can continue to push our institutions to adhere to the core values that brought us all here while also supporting each other. So without further ado, let me introduce my former trainee and now dear colleague and friend, Uju Berry. Um, so Dr. Berry is the director of the Health and Hospitals Domestic and Gender-Based Mental Health Initiative and an associate clinical professor at NYU Langone within the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She's a graduate of Harvard College, Harvard Medical School, Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Columbia University Psychiatry, Psychiatry Residency and Fellowship Programs, plural. She did our um, Women's Program Fellowship as well as a T32 training fellowship with um, Catherine Monk. Um, so she kind of has done all of the training. <laughs> Um, she's an academic researcher and child adolescent and women's mental health clinician uh, with multiple peer reviewed article publications. She's experienced in mental health research, public policy, and has worked with a variety of state and federal institutions, including the CDC, um, Health and Human Services, et cetera. She's the co PI for an NYU site um, on, a long, uh, on a large longitudinal cohort NIH grant called Healthy Brain Child Development Study. Um, she's the director of two citywide initiatives to expand mental health access to families, as you'll hear about, and works closely with the mayor's office um, uh, on these initiatives. Um, and she's truly an amazing person and colleague. And thank you so much for joining us, Uju. Please, uh, please give a hand to welcome Uju. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, you guys are alive. Thank you, it helps me to know that you're here with me. Um, it is quite surreal to be back here uh, in this auditorium. As you heard from Betsy, um, I did a lot of my training here. Um, started in 2011 as an adult resident, followed up by a child fellowship, um, then a women's fellowship, then a T32 fellowship. Um, I might have done a public psychiatry fellowship and an addiction fellowship if I had, if people would have given it to me, but I had to stop at some point. Um, so I stopped in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, 
and then came to NYU, uh, where I have a joint appointment at NYU and at uh, NYC Health and Hospitals. Um, but one of the reasons why it's so surreal is that I see so many friendly faces in the audience here, people who have been my mentors, uh, who are now my colleagues. Uh, and it's a little bit nerve wracking to actually give a talk to your colleagues now, but uh, hopefully you'll bear, bear with me as I talk about my journey uh, and really where we've gone over the past 10 years. Um, so title of my talk is Caring for Families Impacted by Domestic Violence and Integration of Research, Practice and Policy. Um, I don't have any relevant um, financial disclosures, but I do receive some support, um, in particular from the Chapman Perlman Foundation. A lot of the work that I'll be talking about in my slides came from some of that support, uh, as well as some NIH grants as well. So when I was thinking about this talk today, I was like, you know, how do I really talk about all my areas of interest? Uh, and part of it has to do with what I was passionate about. And I talked to you about many of my mentors here and many of my mentors here have known that I was like, what do I do with my life? Um, I remember talking about Jeremy, how do I make this all fit in? Um, and so now I'm coming full circle where I am able to bring in and tie in my clinical work and practice, which focuses on perinatal mental health and childhood mental health, including early childhood mental health and trauma. Also research specifically around implementation and dissemination of mental health services within community settings, as well as the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And finally, one of the th key pieces I think I was so passionate about coming into residency was how do I really think about policy and practice? How does clinical work impact and advocate for your patients? How does research impact and advocate for your patients? Um, and Fortunately, I was able to figure out how to put all three of them together um, and really focus on maternal and early childhood mental health in underserved communities. But ultimately, there is this wave and thread that I want to weave through this, which is really about health and racial equity. You know, my parents grew up as Nigerian immigrants, and oftentimes they talked about giving back to the community. And one of the ways I want to give back to the community is thinking about how can we level the playing field for all those families who are underserved. And so you'll hear throughout how I always really think about going back to equity, equity, equity. So my outline for the talk for today will be focusing on those three different components. Uh, clinical practice, so I'll talk to you about intimate partner violence and mental health, giving some definitions, why, why, why is it important? Why should we have this lecture? Um, then I'll follow up on practice and policy, specifically about those two programs that I currently run, which is the Health and Hospitals Family Justice Center Mental Health Program and the Domestic Violence Shelter Mental Health Initiative. And I'll talk about some research opportunities that I think where the field of, um, of this work can go and some of the work that my colleagues and I are doing in this work with these two grants. So first, intimate partner violence and mental health. I'm gonna start off with a clinical vignette, you know, as a psychiatrist, many of you guys are psychiatrists here, um, you know, it really kind of helps frame the work that we're doing. Uh, one of my other mentors during my time here at Columbia was Josh Gordon, who's now the director of NIMH. And I remember going to his office and he really brought it home to me. He said, your clinical work impacts your research and your research impacts your clinical work. So when I talk to you about the work that we've been doing, I want you to think about Patricia and her story. So this is one of the first, um, one of my first patients as a resident and trainee in the Family Justice Center. So Patricia is a 31 year old woman who grew up in an abusive home. She went this intimate part of violence at home between her mom and biological father. And she herself was physically and verbally abused by her father before her parents divorced. She had been depressed since she was a teenager and took an overdose of pills once, but never got any treatment. She is currently in her second trimester with her first child that was unplanned. Her partner, who has become increasingly verbally aggressive, put his hands around her neck for the first time last week. Although she can't recall the events of the night, she is anxious, sad, unable to sleep, unable to focus, and becomes easily upset. She wants to do the right things for her baby, but is not sure she can cope. So when you hear about this story, I'm gonna go through it. There are a lot of different risk factors and key marks that make this story so uh, powerful. One is intergenerational violence. She herself was in an abusive home. Of course, there's ACEs, adverse childhood exposures. She, um, she witnessed DV between her parents. She also was abused herself. She has untreated mental health, which we all know is a risk factor 
uh, for ongoing sequelae and consequences. She's currently pregnant. Uh, you know, most people think that pregnancy is a time of happiness, but in the DV IPV world, it's actually a time of sadness where sometimes abuse may escalate uh, in unseen um, circumstances. And of course, there was an escalation of violence in her case, uh, coinciding with non-fatal strangulation, which is NFS, uh, which in itself carries a high risk for homicide. She has memory difficulties, which definitely impact her ability to recall the events. Plus, if she wants to press charges, she has to then talk to legal uh, attorneys who will ask her what happened. Uh, but because of her memory difficulties, it places her in, uh, it makes it much more challenging for her. And of course, worsening of symptoms. So something needs to happen um, and, and, and it's making it, and she's getting worse. So when I hear all this and I just laid it all for you, of course, many of you and me in particular, even when I'm reading it still, may feel like a tsunami is washing over me. There's so much stuff that's happening. What am I gonna do? How can I even intervene with this type of stuff? It's not your classic, you know, worried well that we're seeing here. And so I always take a pause and I try to think about some of the work that Alicia Lieberman and Patricia Van Horn have done in their work in putting together child parent psychotherapy, which is this wonderful uh, evidence-based intervention for parent child dy uh, dyads. And one of the things they talk about is ports of entry, which refers to a variety of elements in that relationship um, that can be used as a starting point or opening for an intervention. This allows the clinician to choose ports different aspects of that story and figuring out how to enter and align with that, uh, with that client to move forward. And so for this case, we saw many different ports of entry, right? But the one thing that I always tell my trainees and people who are supervised about is this one, that she's help seeking. Despite all the myriad different struggles that's in her life, she's coming here because she wants help. Well, you hear as I go throughout my lecture day is think about those ports of entry from a clinical perspective. How can we intervene? One of those is actually pregnancy. Pregnancy is a time where people are much more willing to actually make changes in their life because they're no longer thinking about themselves. They're thinking about the dyad. But also as I go along top of a lecture, think about how public policy and how different systems can come together to actually advocate for your patients and advocate for different entry points for them to get access to care. Think about it from a research perspective. What about your research is going to make a difference for particular patients in your room? How can they uh, enter into that relationship with you through some of the research that we know that can help improve lives? So that sets the context. So let's talk about intimate partner violence. I'm here on DV Awareness Month to talk about intimate partner violence. I will use the term IPV and DV interchangeably, but just for you to know, domestic violence is actually the, the umbrella term for IPV. Domestic violence um, uh, talks about violence that happens in the home, in the, the, uh, uh, in the home. IPV is one form of that, um, but also under DV, you can see child abuse or even um, you know, animal abuse. But right now, we're gonna be talking about IPV. This is a definition from the CDC that IPV is a serious preventable public health problem that affects millions of Americans and includes physical violence, sexual violence, stalking, and psychological aggression, including coercive tactics by current or former intimate partner, such as a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, dating partner, or ongoing sexual partner. Now in the literature, or not in the literature, actually in, in um, a lot of social media and just uh, society, most people just focus on physical IPV because um, that's the one that gets people's attention, like the grabbing, the pulling, the punching, the strangulation, the choking. But there's a whole host of different types of forms of IPV that include emotional IPV, such as isolation or gaslighting or um, verbal abuse. There's financial abuse that includes restricting access. Many, many of my clients will come and say um, that my partner, no, like they will be working and their partner has somehow taken their funds away from them and only given them like an allowance. Or they're not allowed to work because their partner doesn't want them to work, which presents a really difficult challenge for families and for people who want to escape an abusive relationship if they don't have economic independence to leave. There's also sexual abuse, um, such as transmission of STIs or reproductive coercion or denying access to, uh, to uh, protective um, family planning. There's definitely intimidation and threats. So using systems against them, um, for example, our undocumented population, they will often be 
uh, often what will be used is like, if you say anything, I'm gonna report you to ICE or I'm gonna withhold your visa application. Those are very common things and terms that we hear about IPB and that's all forms of IPB. So it's not just physical, they're all different forms of IPB. And then usually when we think about forms of IPB, it's about exerting some type of control on a person. So why is IPB a problem? Well, it's a rather large problem in terms of public health and knowledge. You know, before about five years ago, when I was giving talks about this, I would usually say the epidemiology was one in three women. Most recently in 2022, the CDC put out new, um, they did a new survey and it's actually almost one in two women and more than two in five men. I'm gonna repeat that again. So you guys can hear, because it's pretty astounding. Almost one in two women and more than two in five men have experienced some form of physical violence, sexual violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. So no wonder it's a public health problem because it affects the majority of the public, right? Um, and it's concerning because I will go through and talk about the consequences of IPV. Um, but sometimes people think about IPV as a gender-based term, um, mostly because women are, um, because the rates and severity of abuse tend to be more skewed against women. So women are more, more almost five times more likely to be killed uh, by a current and former partner. In particular, violence tends to happen much earlier in women's lives, uh, between the ages of 18 and 24, that's when they're more commonly abused. Many people who come into family justice centers are around that age range. Um, but 75% reporting being abused before they even turn 25, and a quarter of them saying they've been abused by an intimate partner even before the age of 18. Strangulation is also common. I think we're getting more and more knowledge about how common strangulation is. Uh, amongst IPV victims, it ranges between 27 to 68%. Why it's concerning too is that it carries with it an almost 7.5 7 time, 7 times risk of dying by homicide um, by an intimate partner if you've ever been strangled in your life. Given these facts, the NYPD and the district attorneys in New York City have actually made uh, strangulation a felony. So if, any, if anybody's ever been um, choked, um, they will actually be prosecuted um, by the district attorney. The survivor does not need to be present um, in order to, hold, to, um, to talk against that. It's just a felony against the state. Also, homicide is a leading cause of pregnancy-associated maternal mortality. One in five deaths during pregnancy is due to homicide. It's more common than medical causes of death. It's more common than preeclampsia. Dying by homicide is more common than uterine rupture. So again, public health hats. It is affecting everybody um, from birth to, to old age. People from marginalized communities uh, tend to experience IPV at rates equal to or higher than the general population, but they also experience IPV in specific ways and face unique challenges. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned how uh, intimidation and threats can be used uh, against people who are undocumented. You know, in the African American community, um, you know, calling 911 and calling the police is not really always an option for fear of police brutality. Uh, so sometimes just let the violence continue because they worry about their partner or even themselves actually being uh, arrested and harmed. Despite that, they, in 2022, so last year, there were almost 120,000 domestic incident reports that the New York City uh, uh, Police Department responded to. Domestic incident reports are when the NYPD gets called by 911, they go and investigate and they actually like write a form um, that the, the survivor or the client will talk about. Um, so 120,000 uh, reports. There are 365 days in a year. So that added to about 327 domestic incident reports that the NYPD responded to per day in 2022. Again, huge, huge ramifications. Um, in addition, there are huge societal burdens. Um, this report that came out in 2018 that looked at the cost, uh, you know, think about finances, how much is this costing our society? Around $3.6 trillion with uh, about 60% of those costs being due to medical costs, including behavioral health um, treatment. Uh, in terms of you know, work, um, being able for survivors to go to work, they lose a total of 8 million days uh, paid work per year, uh, just due to the amount of IPV that happens in our communities. 
Now, because we are here in, in um, the space, I want to talk about the mental health effects of uh, IPV for adults. Um, there are tons and tons of correlations between IPV and mental health, including PTSD, major depression, including postpartum depression. Um, so whenever I talk to my patients who are uh, reproductive age, I always ask about IPV and counsel them about postpartum depression. Anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, suicide and self-harm, there's actually a report that our colleague Mayumi Akuda wrote that showed that IPV is also associated with bipolar disorder. Um, so that it is associated with multiple different DSM diagnoses. Um, comorbidity tends to be the rule. So most people are diagnosed with not just one disorder, but two or three disorders. So PTSD and substance use or PTSD and anxiety. It's also bi-directional, meaning that IPV increases the risk of having these mental health disorders. But conversely, if you have a mental health disorder, you are more increased risk for actually being vulnerable to IPV. The risks of developing a mental health disorder is dose dependent and um, also based on severity of abuse. The more abuse you have, the more likelihood you either have a PTSD diagnosis or some other type of diagnosis. There's also a lifetime prevalence among the work that we do in inpatient psychiatry, where if you go and they've been several different reports about this, but 30 to 60% of patients who are in an inpatient psychiatric unit have a history of intimate partner violence. As a child psychiatrist, I also tend to think about how does IPV affect children? Uh, there's, uh, what we do know is that there's intergenerational transmission of trauma. So if you witness DV uh, at home, you, the risk of becoming a perpetrator or a victim um, increases. There's also harm to children that can happen directly. So again, in homes where there is DV going on, a third of those kids are actually abused themselves. Think about Patricia, she fell into that category. It also influences uh, the caretaker's parenting style, and I'll show some research in um, an upcoming slides about that. But there have been several, several reports that have come out that really show that uh, effects on children can happen as early as one year postpartum and up to adolescence that affects attachment, affect regulation, cognition, social emotional development, neurodevelopment, even brain architecture. One of my colleagues, uh, Mariah Thomason, is looking at that right now, physical health, language, and even gross motor. So <clears throat> I just painted you this picture of how pervasive intimate partner violence is, especially with mental health. Uh, it behooves us to think about how do we do a better job of thinking about it together. Um, this uh, slide is actually borrowed from Harold Pincus, who is one of my mentors here at Columbia as well, to think about when you have large societal challenges, how can you better target them in a system? One of the best ways is integrated care, making sure that both systems are coming together to talk to each other. For a while, we were not doing that with intimate partner violence and mental health. We were often working independently from each other. Psychiatrists were working independently of advocacy organizations and just not knowing that the other person really existed and could help out. But we are changing that uh, through these past 10 years with the wonderful work of the Family Justice Centers that um, Betsy had alluded to. And there has been a call to action. Think about how can we do a better job of talking to each other and breaking down those silos? And so we had visionaries in 2013, um, Betsy Fiddleson and Catherine Monk, who are sitting right here, uh, who uh, talked with Anna Chapman of the Chapman Perlman Foundation uh, to create the Domestic Violence Initiative. As Betsy alluded to in the introduction, you know, one of the is advocacy organizations opened up and Anna Chapman said, well, shouldn't we put somebody in here, a psychiatrist in here to help with these long waiting lists that were going on for like eight months, nine months, 10 months to be able to see somebody? And they did just that. They talked and talked and came together with this, uh, this vision um, to put together this tripart collaboration between philanthropy, government, and academia to really embed mental health services into an advocacy organization. So embed clinicians into a non-medical setting pretty profound when you think about that. You know, most times integrated care is mostly focused in the medical setting. This time we're taking the medical setting to the community. They would provide free trauma and culturally informed evidence-based practices. And really the mission was to do good clinical work, to teach ourselves, teach psychiatrists more about intimate partner violence, but also teach non-clinicians about mental health and also to really explore some research opportunities as well. 
here was the first group uh, during the retreat. Uh, uh, and uh, as uh, Betsy mentioned, we have our psychiatrist, Mayumi Makuda, our therapist, Rosa, uh, Betsy, and Catherine there. And then I just kind of tagged along. I was actually in my third year of residency here. And I remember Catherine coming to one of my our lectures talking about this new partnership. And I just was like, Catherine, please take me. I want to help. Um, and so I was able to leverage that by uh, having my doing my adult elective, my fourth year elective in the Family Justice Center, uh, followed up with my child fellowship, doing my electives during child fellowship in the Family Justice Centers, my women's fellowship and my T32 fellowship, all in the Family Justice Centers. Um, we've been doing great work. Um, in 2018, we were awarded the Gold Award by the American Psychiatric Association for this novel program. It's the first time in a country where an embedded mental health team were embedded into a family justice center to provide work in the community. And one of the most profound things was how we were able to break down those barriers. So as mentioned, you know, how can this be a port of entry? One of the ports of entries is to think about those barriers and how do you break them down. So some of the client barriers to mental health care in the Family Justice Centers were language, having undocumented status, lack of insurance, limited resources, lack of child care, inexperienced by clinicians um, who were counselors there, distrust in the medical community, stigma of psychiatrists, and also custody concerns. But by co-locating um, positions within an advocacy organization, we're able to address all of those challenges. And so there was really no need for clients to feel um, to feel worried. They were going to a place that they already felt safe, and just down the door, there was somebody else that they can talk to. So what are family justice centers? Betsy already gave you a good summary, but they are a one-stop shop for survivors of DV and elder abuse and sex trafficking to get all their services that they need in one place. Uh, it was founded in the late 1980s by a district attorney in San Diego who realized when he was trying to prosecute the abusers, he needed the help of the survivors. But the survivors were out trying to find new housing. They're out trying to find childcare. They're out trying to help figure out their medical concerns. And so they just could not uh, go to the court. There were barriers. And so to reduce those barriers, he put all those services into one place. Um, and then our program um, came along and was able to be there. The Family Justice Centers are uh, classified as a gold standard by the Department of Justice for helping with survivor intervention. Um, New York City has the largest holdings in the country. There are five of them, one in each borough. Um, so again, one of the big takeaways for you guys, if you, you'll you definitely encounter somebody in your practice who has intimate partner violence, please refer them to one of the family justice centers. They do good work. They're walk-in centers. They're anonymous. You don't need to make an appointment. They're just there and available. New York City uh, in 2022 saw about 139 clients a day at, in one of these five FJCs. Here are some of the services that are offered. Um, language interpretation, financial literacy, financial counseling, immigration legal assistance, shelter, housing advocacy, service for the elderly, risk assessment, case management, and then our program has been able to provide individual and uh, counseling and psychiatric services. So it started out as a pilot program, right, with um, just the psychiatrist, the psychologist, and just in the Bronx and just with Columbia. Then through the work of Thrive New York City with Mayor de Blasio uh, and First Lady Shirley McClay, uh, we were able to expand um, to um, all five FJCs uh, and partner with health and hospitals. Uh, health and hospitals, for those who don't know, is the largest public health care system in the United States. Uh, it provides essential inpatient, outpatient, and home-based services to over 1 million New Yorkers every year and around 70 locations around the city's five boroughs. Um, there are 11 acute care hospitals that make it a great opportunity for us to partner with um, because many of our clients who need more than just mental health care may need to talk to uh, OBGYN and get like family care planning or may need to talk to a pediatrician or a primary care or obstetrician. They will be able to partner closely with health and hospitals and get those services met. Uh, as mentioned, we do have five um, shelter, uh, five uh, FJCs, and they're all partnered with at least one health and hospitals uh, location to, again, help with some of that connection to care. Um, the Bronx opened up in 2014 as a pilot, and then in 2017, we opened officially as part of this new expansion. 
the services are, we have a part-time psychiatrist, full-time therapist, a full-time administrator. All our services are free, by the way, which means that no one has to worry about their ability to pay. No one has to worry about their, you know, insurance status or their documentation status. Again, decreasing barriers to care. We provide evaluation, acute care crisis treatment um, that lasts around three to nine months. We provide uh, psychiatric evaluations, psychotherapy that's individual based or group based, and we do a lot of trainings. Um, so going back to the mandate of how do we give back? So we train a lot of the staff in the FJCs about the work that we do in mental health. This picture here actually is of, oops, sorry, of the training we did um, for lawyers um, via with the partnership of the Office of Victim Services. Uh, we trained, I don't know, I don't know how many, a lot of different lawyers um, throughout the state of New York. Um, and it was a 16 hour training. Um, the reason why it was 16 hours is because they asked for 16 hours. When we were done with 16 hours, they wanted more hours. Uh, just because they want people were hungry for this information. They want to know more about how do you provide trauma response to learning? How do you think about those ports of entry? How do you advocate for your, for your clients? So since 2017, when the program like fully launched in all five shelter, uh, all five centers, we've been able to serve around 298 clients a year. Um, some of the demographics are pretty profound. Uh, so 60% are parents with 30% under, with 30% having children under five, um, and about 5% are currently pregnant. Uh, if you think about the perineal period, which is done some one year postpartum, that percentage will go up to like 10, 20%. Um, this is an, a good, so to think about this, because I'll talk a little bit more about where we're heading, uh, which is thinking about families and how we can start earlier with prevention and thinking about intergenerational transmission of trauma. Another really poignant um, uh, outcome is the mean childhood ACE score is about 9.2. So for those who know the ACEs, there is the, the highest number we can get on ACEs is 10. So the mean, so an average, so there's people who had definitely 10, people had lower, was 9.2. So this is a pretty, uh, you know, underserved, but also pretty severe um, uh, client population that has a lot of different um, adversities uh, in their childhood. 27% were African American, 64% are Latinx, 9% white. Um, a lot of housing insecurity, 73% are housing insecure. 92% live below the federal poverty line. 83% um, are immigrants. 30% speak a primary language other than English. So again, this is the marginalized population that we're seeing who come into the family justice centers. So we have to really think about trauma-informed care, but also culturally informed care as well. This next statistic is actually from uh, a case report that the pilot initiative did, where they took uh, looked at 100, the first 106 patients who came into the Bronx Family Justice Centers. Uh, and what they saw was that 40% had made a prior suicide attempt. When you think about the work that we do in psychiatry, you know, there's certain disorders that tend to have, you know, fairly high risk for mortality. Uh, you know, bipolar disorder, eating disorder, um, substance use disorder, but those tend to be around 20% in terms of their, um, the risk of suicide attempts. Here it's 40% for this, these type of clients, uh, which is profound on, uh, again, thinking again, just about the, the severity, um, the trauma that's going on in their lives. The other profound thing is that of those who had made a, uh, a prior suicide attempt, only half had seen a psychiatrist or a mental health therapist in the past. So high needs, they're just not getting met. Fortunately, our program is trying to meet those needs. And we've been able to show remarkable improvement in just three months. Um, and the, within the first 50 patients we saw in this expansion of 2017, we saw that there was 80% improvement in depressive symptoms using PHQ-9. So we did a, a pre, so once, it came, once we did the first intake, and then three months later, we did the post. 80% improvement in depressive symptoms, 82% improvement in anxiety symptoms, and 75% 75, 75 improvement in PTSD symptoms, just in three months. Uh, our team ended up doing a hybrid uh, uh, implementation effectiveness study 
where we looked at the first uh, two years of the expansion of the five FJCs within while working at H&H. &H. Uh, it was comprised of a dual qualitative and quantitative reporting. This report just came out this year. Um, oops, sorry. And we were able to do anonymous surveys of 53 clients and 130 staff. And also we did seven focus groups. What we found out was that clients reported increased access to care, which is our goal, which is great. We had around 67% seeing a mental health clinician, either a psychiatrist or a therapist within the first two weeks of a request. Very fast. Again, when we're thinking about before, when there was barriers, it took up to nine months, sometimes up to a year to get in with a, with a, a psychiatrist or a therapist. Now they could be seen within two weeks. Clients and staff reported improvements in clients' quality of life, key, um, mood, stress, sleep, distress, decreases in suicide ideation, improved relationships with family and children, improved relationships with the family justice centers. 92% also reported improvement in relations with their family and uh, improved parental efficacy, which comes into play when I talk about some of the research we're, we're doing now. But one of the cool things about this study that we did was the focus groups, because we learned so much from listening to the clients and hearing from their own words about how profound it was to really think about their mental health in this context and being able to provide a safe avenue, a safe space for them. So this is one client who said, the God's honest truth, if it wasn't for the FJC mental health program, I wouldn't be here. They saved my life. It was horrible. And it's very hard for me to trust anybody as it's because of my background, but they made me feel so comfortable and they understood where I was coming from. Here's a rep uh, one of the case managers actually said, so not a client, but a case manager said, and I really think just as a case manager, I don't have it in my mind all night. Like, oh my God, like what is going to happen to this client next week? Oh my God, the court day is next week. This client has like PTSD. So it kind of like takes it off a little bit of the weight off my shoulders to know that I pass her on to a professional who's going to be talking to her. So again, the beauty of the integrated program, we're helping the staff to do their work even better. And then this last quote, I, I think is also just profound. Again, thinking about the parent-child interaction. I'm now seven months into being a single mother and I'm starting to get comfortable in the role. My self-worth is often tied to my son and how I interact with him. But therapy has definitely helped. I see myself being more patient, not having short outbursts, instead dealing with things productively a step at a time. I think it's definitely changed things. I'm different with him. I'm working on my feelings about being a mother. A mental health clinician said something that changed my life. She said to me, as a mother, I have all the power. Maybe I can't control what other people do, but I can be that rock. I can use my pain to strengthen myself and strengthen my son. I can be there for him always. This helped me so much, but yes, he's doing so well. It feels so good that he's doing so well. He's thriving. I feel really good about that. Pretty remarkable, right? That she had that insight uh, to be able to share that, that parent-child relationship and, and really think about changing and challenging that transmission of trauma. So we're growing, so that's the FJC program, but we're growing. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to talk a little bit about this Domestic Violence Shelter Mental Health Initiative. Uh, through the wonderful work we've been doing with the FJC, the city of New York has uh, graciously given us more money to expand that work to now enter into the DV shelter system. There are around 57 domestic violence shelters uh, in all five boroughs in New York City, again, the largest in the country. Um, these shelters are confidential locations um, scattered throughout the city. Um, Sometimes I, I like I go and shut these visits, but I don't really know about the address until the day before. Um, they're confidential for a reason, because people are leaving their home to go to a place where they can feel more safe and they don't want the abuser to follow them. These shelters serve around 10,000 children and adults uh, uh, annually. So a pretty large ask for us to integrate mental health services into this large system, right? Um, but we are able to do it, and we are staying true to some core principles. One is to be free, free care, again, regardless of ability to cost, free care that's culturally and trauma-informed. 
We wanted a universal screening of adults and children. And we moved toward this approach um, because we know through research that a lot of the um, symptoms that happen for adults and children is sometimes just internalizing. So usually it's the externalizing symptoms that really people think about. It's the, the tantrums, the running around, the yelling, the screaming, the pushing. Um, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? But there are also people, adults and children, who don't make noise, who have internalizing symptoms, who may not actually be approached. People think they're quiet, but really maybe they're dissociating or something else is going on. So we want to make sure that we're also reaching everybody. So we're doing universal screening for adults and children. We're going to be able to triage for short-term care, so having like a structured, tiered approach um, based on their symptoms. Um, you know, more intense to less intense. We have long-term connection to h and and other community-based organizations, because once they leave the shelters, the trauma doesn't end. Um, and so we really want to make sure that there's ongoing care and connectivity to other organizations that can take them their care on long-term. We're providing 24-7 crisis support. This was definitely an ask uh, that we were able to help. Um, and this is important because, you know, a traumatic symptom, like a trigger, doesn't always happen so neatly between 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Sometimes it happens at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning or, you know, 3 a.m. on a holiday. Uh, and we want to be able to make sure that those clients have that support. Right now, it's just for adults, but um, in 2024, we're going to be able to staff uh, and start having doing child 24-7 uh, crisis support, too. And, of course, we do extensive support and training to the staff as well. So this is where we were one year ago when we launched in 2022 of October during DV Awareness Month. We were at three shelters in the Bronx, which is great. Pat on the back, um, we move forward. And now this is where we're going to be at the end of this October. So one year later, we'll be at 20 shelters in one year. So we went pretty quickly and pretty fast. Uh, really, it speaks to the need. A lot of these shelters were, were clamoring for more help and more support. Um, and fortunately, we're able to build up a workforce to be able to, to support our expansion. Um, we do need to get to 57, um, and we'll be able to do that um, uh, hopefully by 2025. You know, thinking about public health, we want to make sure that people are aware of this. So we, uh, we had an announcement of our services in May 2023, and the current mayor, Eric Adams, um, uh, gave a quote to the press um, that said, we want survivors of domestic and gender-based violence to know that they are not alone, and New York City is here to help and support them. With this new initiative, domestic violence shelter residents will have access to therapy appointments, trauma-informed care, and ongoing support, marking a significant step in our work to expand and strengthen care for survivors. That's what that's our goal. That's our mission. And it's nice to have the mayor of a city take notice and understand the, the needs of uh, this community. So 10 years later, so you started in 2013 with visionaries Catherine Monk and Betsy Phillison. So where are we 10 years later? We're growing. So the Family Justice Center Mental Health Program, you know, started with one psychiatrist, one therapist, and a resident. Uh, now we have three psychiatrists, five therapists, three administrators, and we're serving with 300 survivors annually in five FJC sites across New York City. Our Domestic Violence Shelter Mental Health Initiative, uh, we have four full-time psychiatrists, two adult and two child psychiatrists, 18 social workers who are going to be embedded into each shelter. Uh, so again, making sure that they we're providing services on site where they feel safe. So they'll go to each shelter and provide a therapy there. And we also have community health workers who will also help with liaisoning to more uh, community-based organizations. So again, in 2025, we hope to be in 57 shelters by that point um, and addressing the 10,000 survivors that use those services, uh, use those shelters. So we've grown. It's been an amazing journey uh, to get to from um, where we were 10 years later to now. Uh, but it does speak to this need of the public partnership, public private academic partnership that has allowed us to get to where we are. And now I'm going to turn and talk about the research. So where do we still need to go? We've talked about clinical work. We've talked about public policy work. But then research is that third little pillar that we need to start thinking about and advocating in terms of those ports of entry to make sure that the clients we serve are getting those evidence-based treatments that are so profound and necessary. 
The WHO, the World Health Organization, has identified uh, at least three key gaps in research for IPV. One is healthcare provision and provision meaning that they are asking there should be rigorous evaluation of any program of service delivery, however successful. So we did that with our paper that we published um, this year. But the next step is to investigate its applicability in other settings. So one thing that our team has been talking about is how do we scale the FJCs to other places outside Edmund, New York City, to other cities like Los Angeles or um, maybe some place in the South. How do we think about other settings where this kind of model can work effectively? You know, the second research gap is psychological and mental health interventions. There's a need to develop trials with sufficient statistical power to assess the effectiveness of different modes of psychological interventions and therapy for women survivors of intimate partner violence in a variety of settings. Um, you hear about this in a couple of slides, but there is this understanding that not all trauma treatment works well for, or no, sorry, not all psychiatric treatment works well for trauma survivors. Uh, if you look at some of the research and you do like more of a sensitivity analysis, some of the people who don't do well are those who have a history of trauma. The third one is mother-child interventions. Intergenerational transmission of intimate partner violence is common and intervention programs to prevent this transmission are needed. Studies about care for mothers and children exposed to intimate partner violence are lacking, particularly from low-income settings. They also are asking for mother-child interventions that have shown to be effective to be, that are needed with alternatives to very intensive um, psychotherapies. So this is some of the gaps that WHO has outlined and some of what some of the research that my team is um, starting to look into. I would talk about one of the work that was so fortunate to be involved in during my time here as a T32 uh, fellow in Catherine Monk's lab. Um, one of the papers we were involved in that was involved in include a secondary data analysis of two combined randomized controlled trials of practical resources for effective postpartum parenting, otherwise known as PrEP. It was pioneered by Elizabeth Warner, who is seen in that picture there. It's a lovely picture of her. Uh, women were recruited um, who were at risk for depression. And the idea behind these, uh, the PrEP was to prevent postpartum depression. So women were at high risk um, and the idea was to prevent it. Uh, they were able to do it. Um, the skills actually involved um, sessions that happened during the third trimester and coincided with prenatal visits that included coaching of mindfulness, newborn care skills, development of a parental identity, and also helping with maternal child interactions. My question when I combined these two RCTs was to examine the role of maternal trauma history uh, on the efficacy of preventing perinatal depression. And what we found was that 33% of the 109 people in these two trials reported a history of childhood maltreatment. Again, not surprising, surprising to some people, but not surprising when you hear about the epidemic of childhood maltreatment uh, that happens in the world. Uh, what was great was that all of those 109 women, um, uh, we were able to, when we combined them all, we were able to show significant reductions in depression and anxiety um, from baseline to six weeks, also comparing between treatment as usual to the PrEP group. However, what was interesting was that there was a moderating, moderating effect of maternal maltreatment history. So those 33% of the 109 who reported childhood maltreatment, such as childhood abuse or childhood neglect, they did not see the same clinical improvements in their depression and anxiety scores. There was something about their trauma history that just did not correlate with being able to uphold uh, that treatment and uh, intake. Everyone else did, but those with trauma history just did not have those same level of improvements. Interestingly enough, though, both groups, despite if the mom had trauma history, they were both able to show improvement in newborn sleep. That their babies, despite the mom's um, own depression and anxiety scores, the newborns were able to sleep more because of this treatment. We, what we hypothesize is that maybe if we would have extended the study out to 12 weeks or 36 weeks, we may actually been able to see reduction in some of those scores for those all the moms even more because there is this interaction between newborn sleep and also newborn care and also parents. 
Um, I'm a mom of three kids, so I totally understand the need to get your babies to sleep. So, you know, the fact that this was able to help despite the mom's own maternal uh, depression anxiety scores, I think is a really interesting niche that we should uh, look into further. Another paper um, that I actually looked at when I was during my training was this paper from Carolyn Green and her group from UConn, uh, which looked at examining intimate partner violence, mental health and parenting uh, for children under the age, between ages three and six, but really thinking about children under five and early childhood mental health. Um, knowing that uh, children under five are at a pretty crucial time in their lives in terms of attention, attachment and whatnot. Um, and so what she showed in 308 mother-child dyads was that 22% reported experiencing physical IPV in the past year, 81% reported experiencing psychological IPV in the past year, and that about a third um, used harsh parenting. What they found was that maternal IPV was not directly associated with child symptoms. And in the previous slide I said, yes, it is. But here what they showed, it was not directly associated but it was indirectly associated due to um, maternal PTSD having influence. Maternal IPV was directly associated with maternal PTSD, and that is what caused the indirect association here. And it also showed, especially for externalizing child symptoms, that it had to do with harsh parenting. So it wasn't direct here, but indirectly due to harsh parenting and its effect in maternal PTSD. Only knowing about IPV is insufficient. You must take into account maternal mental health history. So we talk about IPV, but IPV in itself is not only in itself when you think about childcare. You need to think about the mom's own mental health when you think about um, if the child is able to do better and also in its impact and parenting caregiving capacity. I'm gonna go through these next slides pretty quickly because I've got the warning that I need to finish up. Um, but this one of the, these, this research does beg the question of, can you actually improve the lives of children if you improve the mental health of parents? Uh, my other mentor, Myrna Weissman, uh, uh, who I worked with during my time here, had this, the STAR-D study, which is a pretty novel treatment where they uh, treated moms to remission and showed that moms, uh, children of moms who remitted from depression uh, actually show the children themselves actually also showed improvements in any disorder and depressive disorders. Um, but children of mothers without remission, there were no such improvements in their child psychopathology. So there's something about treating the mom's mental health can indirectly also improve the children's mental health in itself. We're able to also show this for a population that was uh, um, had high rates of social disadvantage, such as poverty, single motherhood, and lower education. Uh, the red is that group here where we showed the mom's uh, HAMA scores that they actually um, drastically went down and persisted up to 36 weeks. The children's in red also went down too when those moms also remitted. So it's not just, uh, so again, the reason that's important is that when we think about families who have uh, ACE high ACEs, as well as high adverse community environments, we can actually do something about the mother-child interaction despite those social determinants of health. The other area when I think about health and racial equity is thinking about the impact of racism on early childhood mental health and how we also need to take that into consideration when we think about adverse childhood experiences. Maternal exposure to racism also um, can in adversely impact children through vicarious racism as well. And so when we think about ACEs, it's not just enough to think about those, those, those 10. We also really add in poverty, discrimination, and some of those other components as well. How we plan on doing this is actually through a SAMHSA grant that we were able to apply and get for. And one of the ways we, we leveraged and talked about this grant was thinking about the service gap. That when we focus on IPV exposed children, especially young children who have a survivor caregiver, uh, so mom who has IPV, and an identified mental health disorder, so already two ACEs there, um, and have adverse ink outcomes, we need to identify them first. Sometimes we can't identify them because of structural disparities. Sometimes we can't identify them just because there are systems, the differences between how the adult system works versus a child system works. We know that adult IPB negatively impacts a child. And so when you hear a parent saying, I'm a victim of IPB, one should really think about the child as well. 
but because they're two different clinic clinics sometimes, we don't always have those interactions. And so how can we better identify these families who are at risk? One of the ways we're doing this is through the SAMHSA grant, a, a direct service category three grant. Um, we have a whole bunch of different agencies involved in this grant um, because it's about breaking down systems, breaking down silos, integrated care, thinking about those ports of entry. Uh, our goal is to screen children zero to five, so early childhood, um, and do screenings using the YCPC, the PSI, and triage them to either uh, evidence-based, triage them to CPP, which is a more intensive type of um, evidence-based treatment, or to circle security parenting, which is less intensive, but really focuses on attachment and is a group model. We will honor the caregiver's uh, intervention preference. Um, we thought this was very important for us to include in this grant because many people with IPB history, again, have been controlled, have been told what to do all their lives. And here we're going to upend that. We want them to tell us what their preference is. Um, we're going to do a lot of training. One of the other cool things again, about breaking down silos is that we're training adult clinicians to actually do the child assessments. Um, the child assessments are actually, we're are asking the parents, so we're not asking them to see children, we're asking them to talk to their parents about the child, how they perceive the child's health doing. Uh, here's our team, um, and we're very excited. Uh, we are in year two, um, and we've already done about 40 intakes. We don't have any post-outcome measures yet, um, but hopefully I'll be able to share that with you next time. Uh, the other study I want to talk about too is actually thinking about that WHO research um, question, like having a study that is sufficiently powered to understand the needs of these families. That study has come into fruition called the Healthy Brain Child Development Study. It's a national initiative funded by the NIH that will be the largest study of child development of its kind. It will we'll recruit about 8,000 children across the United States and we'll follow them prenatally to recruit them in the when they're in the womb and follow them up to age 10. Um, having a, a power such as Eden um, will allow us to be able to map out multiple different aspects of uh, brain development, uh, child development, behavior, and we'll have a special emphasis on adversity. So families coming from socially and economically disadvantaged communities, uh, but also may have some substance use as well. Um, one of the uh, Stats here is that women exposed to three plus ACEs were six times more likely to use illicit drugs in pregnancy. So we're gonna have a pretty heavy recruitment to try and find these families who enroll them into this study. NYU is one of 25 sites across the country that were selected um, to be a part of this national study. Um, and a lot of the different domains will cover EEG um, assessments, MRI assessments. So we'll be actually doing MRI of babies um, babies who are four weeks old, we'll put them in an MRI machine, uh, look at their brain chemistry, look at their brain architecture. We'll have some biospecimens, verbal biosensors, behavior observational and neurocognitive assessments, and also ask for about risk and protective factors. Um, the first funding period only covers the first five years of the study, but here we outline the general timeline of what we hope to enroll over the first four years. Uh, here's our team who um, come from multiple different um, interdisciplinary backgrounds in terms of their expertise. But again, going back to the challenges. So if we're recruiting families who are socially, economically disadvantaged, there are inherently going to be challenges in being able to recruit them and retain them in a study. In order to have a study of that kind, you have to be really conscious of how you think about addressing housing security, food security, IPV, and also how do you engage communities in research, thinking about the research design, thinking about the data collection, thinking about the post data collection. Um, hopefully our, we'll get some first data release in spring of next year, um, and hopefully I'll share that with you too. So in summary, you know, thinking about the ports of entry, you start off by, you know, when I was a clinician, when I was a resident, I was like, okay, I'm a clinician, I'm just gonna treat this person in my office right here. But I hope this lecture helps you really think about how do you think about expanding that and really thinking about supporting parents and families. So going from a clinician, but going to an advocate, thinking about it from a policy perspective, thinking about it from a research perspective. And that's what we did with Patricia, able to get her to FJCs, really helping her uh, you know, reach out to those other advocacy organizations, 
also making sure she was behaviorally um, dealt with and, and really thinking about moving on to hope. Hope is a whisper of yes when the world says no. So with that, I'll end letting you know that Domestic Violence Awareness uh, go Purple Days on Thursday and many thanks to all these people and I'll open up for questions.